Thank you, John, and uh, it's an honor to be here at the uh, Naval War College for the third time now. Um, I uh, am often asked, uh, how did I get on to this subject of naval history? I haven't served uh, in the armed forces. I'm a career civilian, and um, there are many different ways uh, in which I can answer that, and if I, if I, I could go on at, at great length about it. Um, <coughs> but I like to think about the study of war as a way of extracting information about societies that you could not get by studying any other aspect uh, of their history. And I'll illustrate what I'm, what I'm trying to say uh, by describing a exhibit, I guess you would call it. You might call it an outdoor artwork, uh, which is uh, on the southern end of the Golden Gate Bridge. I live in San Francisco in the Marina District, and I can walk to the bridge. And on that walk, uh, there is this enormous section of steel lattice beam uh, that is uh, similar to the uh, uh, system that holds up the bridge. And <coughs> this beam had been taken over to the Berkeley School of Engineering, and the Berkeley engineers had put eight million pounds of pressure on this thing in order to see uh, how well it would uh, hold up. So this is stress testing, something that engineers do. And uh, it's uh, good news for, for all of us who live in San Francisco, maybe even more for those who live across the bridge in Marin, that this uh, beam stood up quite well to that eight million pounds of pressure. A war does to societies, uh, to systems of government, uh, and to individuals what the Berkeley engineers did to that beam. Uh, by putting enormous pressure on something, uh, by putting it under stress, you extract information that you could not receive in any other way. Uh, war is unique in that respect. It tells us something about the underlying societies. The fascist and militarist states of the Axis believed that the democracies were inherently weaker systems and that if you put them under sufficient stress, they would break. Uh, World War II was, I think, at its very base, a struggle between competing visions of how to organize a society. And I've spent a lot of time and attention uh, in this trilogy on the issues of uh, media, of press coverage, of propaganda, of the way that the war was presented uh, to the civilian populations of the contending countries uh, of the United States and of Japan. Uh, I think at the heart of this question of how the big decisions were made, uh, you really have to go beyond the conventional lanes uh, that we usually stay in as military historians. You need to get into the realm of politics, which of course is an entirely different animal. And yet, uh, this division that we have uh, developed between these different types of history, I think, meets right at this intersection where so many of these crucial uh, issues have been decided. Uh, and this has been uh, one of my arguments in uh, developing a new way of telling the story of this war. Uh, World War II, I think, showed that the democracies once aroused were inherently stronger than the authoritarian and totalitarian models. So why another history of the Pacific War? Uh, ha aren't there an enormous mountain of books that have already been written? Yes, uh, of course that's true. And there's a certain amount of, I think, World War II fatigue, which I understand and I even share. Um, there has been a tendency, I think, in the World War II literature uh, to try to pick increasingly narrow aspects of the conflict uh, to slice the pie more and more narrowly uh, and to uh, delve very deeply into relatively small subjects. Now, that tendency, I think, over time results in a very rich literature, and I think we understand this subject much better than we did in the past, collectively. Uh, but this trend toward increasing specialization uh, also uh, results over time in a historical literature which is fragmented and piecemeal. Uh, 
uh, military history has been uh, treated as a subgenre, uh, even dare I say it as a kind of ghetto uh, within the field, hermetically sealed off from other important aspects of history. It has been neglected in the halls of academia. Uh, and I think there are different reasons for that, but I think the fallacy that to study is to glorify uh, is very much at the heart of it. My last book, uh, Pacific Crucible, which uh, dealt with the, really just the first six months of the Pacific War from the uh, surprise strike on Pearl Harbor to the American counterpunch at Midway six months later, um, was, was well reviewed. There was one review I remember that was a friendly review the reviewer said, Toll occasionally does stray out of his lane uh, into uh, areas of uh, politics, for example, diplomacy, uh, rather than sticking to uh, the narrow path of naval history. Well, I uh, don't take that as a criticism, but rather as a compliment. I think the stay in your lane mentality uh, can be a straitjacket and has been in military history. I have strayed out of uh, my lane uh, from the very beginning of my career. I did it in six frigates. Uh, I intend to do it in all future uh, works. The Pacific War uh, has larger dimensions, politics, diplomacy, the management of a global allied coalition, foreign policy, social his history, propaganda, uh, the organization of the economy for total war. Uh, the planning for the post-war future in Asia. Uh, all of these are important subjects that are usually completely omitted in histories of the Pacific War. The question of how and when and how aggressively to fight the Pacific War uh, relative to the war in Europe arose to the highest levels of politics and diplomacy. It became an issue in electoral politics in, in the midterm congressional elections of 1942 and again in the presidential election of 1944. Uh, it was at the heart of Anglo-American negotiations uh, in the many allied conferences that took place during the war. It played into the future of Western colonialism in Asia. And it was an ideological struggle, the Pacific War, between uh, Japan's pan-Asian vision of uh, uh, liberating Asia for the Asians, which was an inevitably a somewhat enticing proposition, uh, and uh, the competing concept of a universal principle of democracy and self-determination. Um, I believe in a narrative style of history, not as the only way to write history. Uh, I think there are other ways to write history, but I believe that the narrative style of history, which combines scholarly rigor with a storytelling sensibility, uh, can and does have great power. Uh, complicated storytelling, I believe, can be, in, its, in a sense, a kind of argument uh, in its own right. And ever since I first realized that I had a real obsession with history, probably at about the age of 12, uh, I have sought out authors who managed to pull this off, to bring some of the storytelling techniques that uh, novelists, or dare I say it, even filmmakers, might use uh, to bring uh, the reader into the story. And I have found that for all the enormous number of books that are published uh, each year, um, books that really uh, walk that line between uh, respect for the subject uh, but great storytelling are, are as rare as a unicorn. And when I find them, I seize upon them and read them uh, regardless really of what the subject is. The scholar's approach of uh, offering a thesis then marshalling evidence uh, has real power and has most often led to some of the deepest insights uh, into history. And as Gordon Wood has observed, uh, popular historians depend on the work of academic historians while the reverse is not necessarily true. Uh, but I think comparing the two directly is beside the point, really. It's like asking, what's a better tool, a hammer or a wrench? You need more information to answer the question. At its best, the narrative style actually accomplishes something I think that the more clinical approach does not accomplish. It brings us closer uh, to the experiences of those who were there, who made the decisions, and it puts us into their shoes, 
It allows us to see through their eyes, and that brings a richer and fuller and more satisfying way of understanding why and how important decisions were made. In history, whatever else it is, it's also a genre of literature, and that has always been true uh, since history was first written down. Herodotus, Thucydides, Plutarch, Sallust, Tacitus, Edward Gibbon, Henry Adams, Winston Churchill, they were all storytellers. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt um, said that he thought imagination was the most important quality of a historian. That's a very provocative point, isn't it? Uh, the ability to put oneself into the mindset of people living in the past is actually a real challenge, a very difficult thing to do. Uh, my purpose is to assimilate many different uh, contending, competing points of view uh, into one narrative. and. I have always thought that the highest praise uh, that someone might offer me for my work is that I could not put it down. I could not put it down. Uh, there is no higher praise, I believe. I think we have had a dearth of good narratives addressing the Pacific War in all of its vast and terrible sweep. And I think I can claim that my trilogy is the first history of the entire Pacific War to be published in at least 25 years, and the first multi-volume history of the Pacific War to be published since Samuel Eliot Morrison's series published in the 40s and 50s. The Pacific War was, by a vast margin, the largest naval war ever waged. It was, in all likelihood, and we can hope, the largest naval war that will ever be waged. It was the only naval war that has ever been waged across the entire length and breadth of the Pacific Ocean, an ocean so large that you could fit all of the world's land masses into it with room to spare. It was the only instance in which opposing fleets of aircraft carriers met in battle, and there were five such battles in the war. It provided the most complete demonstration of the means by which submarines could destroy enemy supply lines. It led to a fundamental revolution in naval doctrines, putting an end to the era of the big gun battleship as the queen of naval power and establishing carrier aviation and submarines as the principal means of waging war at sea. I think there has been a tendency, axiomatic, I think, of all military history, uh, to treat uh, naval warfare as uh, a subgenre of a subgenre. Uh, that is to say, uh, we are a land-dwelling species, so it's natural for us to think of war on land as the main plot uh, and naval war as a subgenre that should be handled by specialists who uh, write naval history and nothing else. Uh, I think our popular entertainment in many cases has reinforced a popular misimpression uh, that the Pacific War was principally a war fought on islands. Uh, an island hopping campaign waged by the army and especially the marines against Japanese troops in jungles and on uh, remote Pacific atolls. And indeed it might be said that for many Americans who uh, don't um, know much about the Pacific War, uh, it was a conflict that began with Pearl Harbor. It continued with a trans-Pacific campaign of bloody island fighting, most famously at Iwo Jima, and ended at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But one need only glance at a map of the Pacific to grasp that this war was principally a naval and air campaign in which the destruction of the Japanese Navy was the paramount factor uh, leading to the Allied victory. And Marines uh, might seize remote Pacific islands in savage and valorous combat, really in some of the most awful combat, I think, in our history. Uh, but they could only do that after being delivered safely to the beaches and supported by uh, ship-to-shore bombardment and air support. Conquering an island in the Pacific was almost never a goal in its own right. And when an island served no purpose, it was simply bypassed, its garrison left to wither on the vine. An island was seized when it was needed as a new sea or air base with a new harbor blasted out of the coral, with an airstrip carved out of the jungle uh, to allow the fleet and the bombers to consolidate uh, their westward uh, advance and to gather their strength for the next offensive push. Any big historical narrative dealing with the entire Pacific War, in my view, 
uh, should have the naval campaign at the spine of the narrative, and I have worked in that spirit. The Pacific War was the largest, bloodiest, most technologically complex amphibious war in history. Amphibious war, striking an enemy on land by way of sea, was the most difficult and precarious of any type of major military operation. Prior to the Second World War, the largest and most relevant precedent was the Gallipoli Campaign in the Dardanelles during the First World War, and that gave very little reason for confidence. Uh, in order to be sure of success, the amphibious attacker must possess overwhelming advantages. Uh, by its nature, it required close cooperation between the services, between the Army, the Navy, the Marines, uh, between the different arms of the Navy, logistics, aviation, and therefore amphibious war exposed and exacerbated all of the latent inter-service antagonisms and rivalries. Uh, consider that uh, at the time of Pearl Harbor and throughout the Second World War, uh, there was no defense department. There was a Navy department and a war department, each headed by a civilian cabinet secretary who reported directly to the president. <coughs> there was uh, no joint chiefs of staff uh, prior to Pearl Harbor. Uh, that body was convened as an ad, ad hoc committee uh, in order to um, uh, have some sort of structure with which to meet the British in the first wartime summit. But the JCS uh, throughout the war operated with no statutory authority and had no chairman. So Admiral Ernest King, the Chief of Naval Operations, and uh, General Marshall, Army Chief of Staff, uh, had to muddle toward consensus. Uh, and if and when they disagreed, there was no mechanism to resolve that dispute except to go directly to President uh, Roosevelt and ask him to resolve it. And of course, they didn't want to do that. So they were forced uh, to work together, forced uh, to muddle toward consensus, and that's how the big decisions of that war were made. They all knew that even as they were fighting this unprecedented global conflict, they were looking to the post-war future. And they knew that there was an enormous struggle looming in the post-war future. <coughs> uh, that <coughs> Congress was determined uh, to unify the services into a single defense uh, department and that the parochial interests of the different services would be very much at stake. Uh, and that represented a kind of game within the game uh, that was waged during the Second World War. The <coughs> Marines um, had, more than any other military organization, uh, studied uh, f uh, amphibious war, uh, had trained for it, had developed uh, new tactical uh, doctrines, and had developed the landing craft uh, that would be needed uh, to fight uh, this uh, unprecedented amphibious war in the Pacific. Uh, even so, the entire enterprise had to be developed very much on the fly, uh, and there was quite a bit of learning how to fight by fighting uh, in the Pacific War. And I think this revealed the remarkable talent in the ranks of the American military, and particularly the very high quality of leadership uh, that we had, and I think this institution, in the case of the Navy, uh, has uh, something to do with that. Uh, consider, in 1900, when the senior admirals and generals who fought the Second World War had entered the service academies around 1900, 1905, uh, radio was brand new. It was just being developed. Uh, I think it was first used at sea uh, in uh, naval conflict uh, in the Russo-Japanese War of, of 1905-1906. Submarines. Uh, were uh, experimental vessels that uh, usually posed a greater threat to their own crews than they did to the enemy. Um, the Wright brothers got off the ground, I believe, in 1903. The entire history of aviation uh, took place during the careers of uh, Admiral King, Admiral Nimitz, uh, General Marshall, and so forth. Uh, it was a uh, coal-powered fleet uh, that had to be changed to an oil-powered fleet. Uh, new engines, uh, reciprocating engines, uh, were replaced by turbine engines. Uh, and so I think it's remarkable that virtually all of the senior American military commanders of the Second World War 
uh, were uh, forced to develop their understanding of these new technologies in the course of their careers, and yet they were there and they were ready uh, to fight this war uh, when it was thrust upon us in December 1941. I also think uh, that it's interesting and noteworthy that virtually all the major American military commanders of the Second World War, uh, perhaps with the exception of General MacArthur, were almost completely unknown outside the armed forces uh, in 1939. Uh, the Navy, in the Navy, almost uh, none of the admirals uh, who fought the Second World War had combat experience uh, prior to the war. And yet the services had uh, preserved and developed this vital intellectual capital over the course of the peacetime. Uh, in the Navy, all officers headed to higher rank virtually, had to come through the Naval War College. Uh, so they had studied and prepared for this Pacific War and were to a remarkable degree uh, ready uh, to, to fight this terrible conflict. Uh, the Pacific War, of course, though it was the largest naval war in history and, as I've said, the largest and most complex amphibious war in history was a secondary theater. Uh, Europe first was the fundamental basis of the global allied strategy and yet the Pacific War so often uh, required more attention because of uh, constant emergencies early in the war. Uh, the logic of Europe first, uh, I believe, was unassailable. Uh, but it raised subsidiary questions uh, that were a constant source of conflict. Uh, granted that we were going to regard Nazi Germany as the prime enemy and devote uh, the majority of our uh, shared allied effort to defeating Nazi Germany first, uh, could a uh, counteroffensive against Japan be launched prior to the defeat of Nazi Germany. And what exactly were the ratios? The British, I think, would have liked us to fight with maybe 5% of our total strength in the Pacific. Uh, Admiral King in the Navy uh, would have liked something more like 30%. Well, that's an enormous difference, isn't it? And uh, this was a source of a constant struggle, pitting the Americans against the British, uh, in many cases the Army against the Navy, the Navy against the Marines, uh, the Army Air Forces against the Army and also the Navy, the Naval Aviators against the tradi traditional li uh, Naval Line Officers, uh, the Surface Navy. It pitted MacArthur against everyone who did not share his view that he should immediately receive more troops and ships and airplanes, regardless of what was happening elsewhere, and this uh, resulted in a, a Solomon-like decision to divide the theater between the Army and the Navy. Uh, the lecturer next week, I think Crossman wrote uh, Sailor in the White House, which is a very interesting book. Um, FDR was a Navy man at heart. Uh, he had served as Assistant Secretary of the Navy uh, for almost the entire two terms of the Woodrow Wilson administration. Uh, served longer in that job than any other job in his career, except the presidency itself. Uh, he was, in addition, one of the uh, largest collector of uh, naval historical uh, documents and uh, ships and uh, prints and other such memorabilia. As uh, president, uh, he had been instrumental in uh, gathering together the historical documents of the early American Navy and publishing those, uh, a resource which I found to be tremendously useful in, in writing six frigates. Uh, MacArthur used uh, a very aggressive public relations strategy uh, and even politics to ob obtain more troops and ships and planes and to ensure that the road to Tokyo would lead through the Philippines. Uh, he became a stocking horse for the Republican presidential nomination in 1944 uh, while then and later denying that he ever knew anything about it. And so allocation of uh, military assets to his theater became a point of attack uh, in that bitterly fought presidential campaign of 1944, that wartime campaign. Uh, and it embittered the campaign because both FDR and his rivals, I think, both thought uh, that the other side had politicized the war. Uh, and FDR could not reply in many cases because of wartime secrecy. Uh, he used to tell a, a story 
which was not true, actually it was a joke, uh, about the Marines on Guadalcanal. There are two Marines uh, at Henderson Field on Guadalcanal. One says to the other, the original form of the joke is, if you want to get a Jap, I can tell you how to do that. I won't say that. If you want to kill a Japanese soldier, here's what you do. You walk up the hill and you shout to hell with Hirohito, the Emperor of Japan. And <coughs> the Japanese soldier is going to pop his head up and then you shoot him. And so the Marine said, all right, I like that idea. I'm going to do that. He walked up the hill. He sh shouted to hell with Hirohito. And it wasn't loud enough. So he said to hell with Hirohito. And the Japanese soldier popped his head up and said, to hell with FDR. And so the Marine slung his rifle over his shoulder, he walked back down the hill, and his friend said, well, what happened? I didn't hear a shot. And he said, well, I know we're supposed to win this war, but I'll be damned if I'm going to shoot another Republican. <laughs> <laughs> there are, uh, of course, uh, uh, almost a limitless number of FDR biographies. There are a smaller but still very large number of MacArthur biographies. Uh, they tend to forcefully emphasize the political dimension of decisions uh, that were made, but often tend to slight the very real and difficult military strategic choices uh, that faced the leadership uh, in the Pacific. And I think that may simply be, to return to the theme uh, I brought up earlier, that we've had this division of um, military history and political history, and what happens when you have to confront uh, uh, a question, for example, of how to interpret the Honolulu Conference or the Pacific Strategy Conference. This was when FDR visited Oahu in July 1944 and summoned MacArthur uh, from Australia to meet with him and Admiral Nimitz and Admiral Leahy uh, to decide a number of important uh, decisions. Uh, the most uh, significant and immediate uh, decision was, do we invade the Philippine island of Luzon, the large northern island of Luzon, where Manila was. Uh, MacArthur argued that uh, we had to do that, that it was militarily the right decision, but also politically the right decision. Uh, Nimitz uh, argued, uh, I think in a pro forma way, for an alternative uh, that we ought to land on the island of Formosa, present day Taiwan. Um, almost all of the treatments of this subject that I have read uh, have failed to do it justice. And I think that there has been a tendency of the political biographers to forcefully emphasize the political dimensions of this meeting. Uh, and the military historians who are more well versed uh, on the purely military issues uh, that were being decided have in many cases uh, followed dutifully in the footsteps of the political biographers uh, because they feel as if uh, this is a field that is beyond their area of authority. Uh, and so what we have is in many cases evidence-free speculation of a kind of secret handshake uh, between MacArthur and Roosevelt, uh, a proposition for which there is no evidence and which I find to be uh, completely implausible. Uh, and so I will uh, deal with that subject at greater length in my third volume. Now, I don't want to go on forever, so I'll close so we can have questions. Uh, but I would like to close by quoting Theodore Roosevelt, uh, who was uh, one of my uh, colleagues in this subspecialty of early American naval history and who had uh, an important role to play in the creation of this institution. Uh, TR published at age 22 while a law student at Columbia, uh, his book, The Naval War of 1812, which was a major work on that subject, which remains remarkably current even after 130 years. And TR, as I said, took the rather provocative, provocative view that the most important quality of the historian was imagination, his word. And this quote, uh, when I came across it, rang true to me in a very powerful way. However accurate this historian may be, he cannot be in the broadest sense truthful unless he has the power to visualize to himself what he has found in the past, unless he has the power not merely to visualize it himself, but to put it down in words so that his readers can visualize it also. He must paint for us the life of the plain people, the ordinary men and women, 
of the time of which he writes, the instruments of their labor, the weapons of their warfare, the wills that they wrote, the bargains that they made, the songs that they sang when they feasted and made love, he must use them all. He must never forget that no event stands out entirely isolated. He must trace from there its obscurity and humble beginnings, each of the movements that, in its hour of triumph, have shaken the world. Thank you very much for your time and the opportunity to speak here at the Naval War College. I'd be happy to entertain any questions, if there are any. Well, yes, sir. Long we have to wait for the third line. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a sensitive issue. I, I was asked that actually at an event. Jim Hornfisher asked me that. Uh, many of you may know Jim Hornfisher. He's a, a terrific historian. His last book was Neptune's Inferno, about the naval war, uh, battles off of Guadalcanal. He asked me that while I was standing next to my editor, Star Lawrence. <laughs> so he, he put me on the spot. I think uh, fall, uh, 2018 is a reasonable target. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yep. Yes, sir. Uh, today, I understand that the military uh, will all join together on a battle in advance. Is this when? When did they get this cooperative spirit? That the different services uh, would yes. would get together and plan. Well, I think a lot of it. Uh, was uh, World War II. They were forced uh, to uh, plan together. A lot of the uh, planning apparatus of the Joint Chiefs was created uh, after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, there were very limited mechanisms for joint planning prior to the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, and uh, this was one of, I think, the legitimate criticisms of the uh, peacetime armed forces. Uh, so I, I think a lot of it began under the, under the tremendous stress of this immediate emergency after this uh, devastating strike on Pearl Harbor. Didn't Congress get involved? Yes, Congress uh, threatened to, by, by uh, force of law, uh, combine the services into a Department of Defense during the conflict. <coughs> and there were several bills introduced uh, in 1942 and 1943. Eventually, uh, General Marshall uh, successfully argued to congressional leaders that this issue should be uh, postponed until the post-war period uh, because it would create too much chaos in the ongoing management of the war and would also expose uh, these uh, very strong uh, parochial service uh, interests. Yes, sir. Why did Roosevelt tolerate MacArthur? <laughs> well, uh, it's a very good question. Uh, MacArthur, in the f first months of the war, really, uh, became suddenly very, very famous and uh, was the best known, most popular military leader. In fact, I think the Gallup polls uh, had already begun to ask this question, who, which Americans do you admire most? And uh, as of 1942, the three most highly admired Americans, according to that poll, were Franklin Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt, and Douglas MacArthur. And so he had, uh, he had a, a, an immense, immense standing with the American people, and I think that alone made it very difficult to, to fire him. Of course, Truman eventually did. Um, there are others, I think, who, who have argued that perhaps Roosevelt was playing a, a shrewd game and that by uh, allowing this kind of political excitement in 1944 among certain important leaders in the Republican Party to coalesce around this very unrealistic idea of drafting MacArthur as a, as a, to become a second McClellan uh, to run against the commander in chief in wartime. Uh, that by doing that, um, <coughs> he uh, took some of the wind out of the sails of the uh, Republican candidate who eventually got the nomination, Thomas Dewey, a governor of New York. And so there's that, that subplot as well. I think in addition that uh, 
Roosevelt did respect MacArthur's abilities uh, as a general and uh, felt personal responsibility to not only keep MacArthur uh, in place, to allow him to have his half of the Pacific and to allow him to return to the Philippines because MacArthur himself, I mean, sorry, Roosevelt himself had ordered MacArthur uh, to leave his forces in Bataan and Corregidor and uh, go to Australia. So he was personally implicated in that decision. Why didn't he, why didn't he fire MacArthur right away, the way they fired the people in Pearl Harbor? Well, I, uh, I think a lot of it has to do with the way the news was presented to the American people in that first month of the war. Uh, and so the, the fact that our entire battle line was knocked out at Pearl Harbor, eight battleships knocked out of action, was regarded as a disgrace. And someone would have to pay for that disgrace. Uh, three weeks later, when it became clear that our defenses in the Philippines were going to very quickly crumble, uh, by that time, the mood of the press, and I think maybe the American people, had shifted, and now we were looking for uh, uplifting stories. Uh, and so, uh, MacArthur's very significant command failures in the Pacific were never exposed uh, to scrutiny in the same way. But I, I agree, I, I don't think that there's a great deal of logic or justice uh, in that disparity. Uh, but. A lot of it, I, I really do believe, uh, had to do with the way these events were being presented uh, to the American people at the time. Thank you. Yep. Following up on that, uh, MacArthur was somewhat different in that he was in the field, in the battle. Uh, his family, too, surprisingly. Yep. You know, I, I get the impression he strongly protested his order to, to leave. It, was it really like that this. strong? Or did he see his family and himself in that same vein as somebody who should should be out of the conflict and survive to fight again? I think I think the available evidence is that MacArthur expected to, to stay there and to either die or be captured uh, with his family, with his wife and at that time four-year-old son, yeah. and was committed to stay, and uh, was uh, ordered away by Roosevelt. And uh, from that time, I think it's, it's only human to, to want to return to the Philippines and uh, liberate Luzon in particular. <coughs> and so, you know, MacArthur's often been criticized for having this very one-dimensional idea that first we get the Philippines back and then we worry about Japan. And, you know, at the time, uh, many Navy leaders, but also George Marshall and others in the Army pointed out that it, it may be smarter to try to get a quick checkmate here by going directly to, to Japan. And if we win the war, then the Philippines are liberated anyway. Um, <clears throat> the decision to go back to Luzon, in my view, uh, was correct not only for political reasons but even for military reasons, and the, the reasons for that, and this is complex, and I could go on probably at, at excessive length about it, and I will deal with this in my third volume, uh, the principal alternative that had been offered by the Navy, the invasion of Formosa, and uh, establishing positions on the China coast, uh, the more military analysts looked at that option, the less they liked it. And it became clear by August 1944 that the Army didn't have enough troops, particularly enough service troops available in order to launch uh, that uh, operation. Uh, and so Luzon, in a sense, won by default. Yes, sir. In the uh, in this advertisement, for, as it were, that appeared for this talk here, it, you mentioned that uh, the book deals with, uh, I think, through the capture of the Marianas, uh, and that being a point from which there is no recovery for Japan. I, I was interested in that, and I'd like to hear your thoughts about why that was, why that was important. Yeah, I, I think the Marianas, uh, the capture of the Marianas in, in July 1944 uh, did spell the end of any remaining hopes that Japan might have had to try to reverse the tide of conquest that was washing over them. Uh, the 
uh, Marianas Islands, uh, Saipan, and Guam are within bomber range of Tokyo uh, with our very long range bombers, the B-29, which was just coming into service at that point. Uh, it um, was a, a, Saipan was the first island in which there was a large civilian Japanese population and that had Im immense significance through the uh, leadership's eyes in Tokyo. Uh, and there was this immense naval battle, the uh, Battle of the Philippine Sea, also remembered as the Marianas Turkey Shoot, in which Japanese carrier air power was really irreparably destroyed. And uh, so for all of those reasons, uh, really it was clear even to the Japanese leadership at that point that they had lost the war. And the last uh, 13 months of the war uh, became this, this tension between we know we've lost and yet we're not going to surrender. And, uh, and the Japanese government fell. Uh, Hideki Tojo was driven from power immediately after the fall of the Marianas. Uh, and so uh, I do believe that was the decisive victory of the Pacific War. Jim Hornfisher has a book coming out on the Marianas, which uh, I would recommend. He's a very good author. One more question, and yes. getting back to the Philippines. Yeah. It seems to me, it, it, going back in my, my sense of history, is that MacArthur criticized Wainwright for surrendering. Mm. He wanted him to fight to the death. Mm. Is that correct or not? Yes. He, he, uh, he, he did criticize him privately. Uh, <coughs> of course, later he um, recommended that he be decorated. Uh, but. Um, yeah, MacArthur was a, uh, you know, I'm not a psychologist, but I, I, I think some have, have proposed that he may have had a personality disorder, like a narcissistic personality disorder or something like that. Well, you know, psych psychological history has a very bad name, uh, but MacArthur really was a confabulator, uh, meaning that he would fill in his memory uh, with self-serving versions of what had happened previously. <laughs> and, you know, you, as a historian, you see this happen again and again where, you know, he's got many different versions of something that happened earlier. And, uh, and they're all in conflict. Uh, and in every case, there's a reason why he's remembering that something happened that way because it puts him into a better light. MacArthur is in many ways, I think, a very unattractive personality. Um, from his soaring reputation during the war, uh, I think his star has fallen very dramatically among historians and biographers. Probably that's been a more dramatic decline than for any other uh, important historical figure of that era. And, um, <coughs> and yet MacArthur was also an immensely talented person. He was, uh, I believe, absolutely brilliant. Uh, and uh, he had a sense of stagecraft and showmanship which uh, was often destructive, but which was very effective immediately after the Japanese surrender it, when uh, he served essentially as a kind of latter-day shogun uh, over the Japanese. And so I, I think that combination of qualities worked well uh, for the occupation of Japan after the Second World War. Yes. Did you discover any documents in your research that changed the way you thought about anything? I mean, inevitably, you probably have some preconceived notions about a certain topic or subject. Yeah. And I'm curious to know whether or not any of your research flipped that on its head. Well, I, um, you know, I've turned up a lot of very interesting stuff in archives. In many cases, it's it's simply kind of sharpening a point. Uh, particularly because many of these issues have been studied now for several generations of historians. Uh, but just to give you a, an example, uh, General Robert C. Richardson was the commander of army forces in the Pacific Ocean area. So in Nimitz's theater, uh, he was the army's top general. And uh, his personal diaries have been kept private until just six months ago uh, when his uh, grandson made them available to researchers. And <coughs> those diaries um, depict a uh, real struggle between the Army and Navy in 
the Nimitz uh, headquarters uh, that I think cast things in a slightly different light. Nimitz was a great leader, uh, one of the most respected uh, leaders of that war, <coughs> possibly the most respected uh, <coughs> naval warrior in the history of the U.S. Navy, uh, even. Richardson's uh, portrait of him cuts against that a bit uh, and uh, depicts an admiral who was, had spent his entire uh, adult life in the Navy and was very committed to the Navy's parochial interests. Of course, Richardson is not an unbiased observer. And yet, uh, these diaries uh, going on at great length with great specificity, I think give us a slightly more nuanced picture of what was happening in Pacific Fleet headquarters during the war. Yes, sir. So uh, I know that uh, Admiral Wiley uh, knew a little bit about the difference between sequential and simultaneous strategies in the Pacific, and particularly the way that the submarine strategy yep. struggled with uh, the economic wherewithal of mm. the capabilities of the Japanese, but we didn't really know what was going on. What are your thoughts about the difference between both the principal uh, theater direction, split theater, but also this other aspect of this submarine campaign undermining the Japanese effort. Yeah, it, uh, you're right. It really was two different campaigns. The submarines really fought their own war in the Pacific. Um, and because of the inherent secrecy of undersea operations, uh, this slow but then very dramatic garroting of Japanese sea communications, so vital to their economy, particularly oil. The Japanese have negligible domestic oil production, therefore uh, their entire economy, their entire war effort uh, relied upon this tenuous link of running tankers uh, between their captured Dutch East Indies uh, oil fields in Borneo and Sumatra and the home islands. And a aggressive fleet of submarines operating in the Western Pacific sinking those tankers uh, would essentially kick the, the foundations out of the entire Japanese imperialist project. That is, in fact, what happened. Uh, but as you say, the sequential campaigns, the, the counteroffensive across the Pacific, one operation after another, one island after another, one battle after another, uh, took place in parallel with uh, what was a cum cumulative ship by ship destruction of those Japanese uh, supply lines. And so it was really two different campaigns that intersected only occasionally. And uh, this I don't think was fully appreciated at least outside the highest command levels of the Navy until after the war and uh, the submariners uh, <coughs> having uh, sunk something like 60%, I believe, was the figure of the total tonnage in the Japanese merchant marine, uh, while uh, suffering very high casualties relative to the small number of personnel that served in submarines, uh, demanded after the war uh, recognition of that extraordinary accomplishment, and uh, I believe that they have received it uh, rightfully. I like your thoughts on uh, George Marshall, but I know that regardless of that imperative, they definitely heard that in the book. But George Marshall, does he rise, in your opinion, above the parochialism of, of the services um, in terms of his leadership in the world? Or how, how much do you look at that in terms of his thinking? Yeah, I, I, would, say, I would say that the answer to that is yes. Uh, he did rise above the parochial uh, interests of the army. It was a process. Uh, but I can point to several specific instances in which uh, he favored a, a course of action uh, that uh, seemed to f benefit the, the Navy's way of thinking about how to fight the war. Uh, <coughs> we had discussed this question of Luzon versus Formosa. Uh, well, Marshall was uh, really coming down hard on MacArthur uh, 
at that point and saying uh, liberating the Philippines is not the ultimate objective here. Defeating mm -hmm. Japan is the ultimate objective. The liberation of the Philippines follows from that. Uh, and, um, and had uh, a really uh, taken on MacArthur directly. Uh, so I think there, I think he was in, in many ways the single most indispensable military leader uh, of the Second World War. I also think that in the literature, uh, journalists and historians and biographers are similar in this sense. Uh, we like conflict and we tend to, to emphasize conflict. Uh, the struggle between Marshall and King is very much at the heart of global policy making during the Second World War. Uh, they didn't particularly like each other and yet they were partners as well. And they had constant uh, recurring conflicts over many issues and yet in almost every case they managed to work those issues out through negotiations rather than having to appeal to Roosevelt uh, to solve them and so I think it's it's best to think of the King Marshall partnership as being at the heart of the American war effort. I was intrigued by your early comments about uh, popular history and, and uh, academic history having sort of a one-way relationship. Uh, I'm happy to report here in our strategy and policy course, we do use quite a bit of popular history, including Eric Larrabee's uh, mm. book about FDR's of Ten, a chapter on Nimitz, a chapter on MacArthur, mm -hmm. as a way of looking at the bigger uh, causes, social, um, institutional behind the war, not just the person itself. So it's a use of biography differently. If you were to make a case uh, for popular history to a group of academic Historians, how would you do it? What, what would you say is the value that they should rethink that one-way relationship? Well, first of all, I would, <coughs> I would just, at the risk of repeating myself, say I don't think that the narrative form of history should replace uh, the more academic, uh, develop a thesis, martial evidence, then restate the thesis in light of the evidence. I don't think that those two, that one has to replace the other. I believe that there is value in both approaches. Uh, I, I think the narrative and storytelling approach, the great power that it has, is that it can bring you closer uh, to the perspectives of those who were making decisions at the time. Uh, and the point is obvious and yet it, it is worth repeating that uh, <coughs> at the time that these events took place, no one could see into the future. Uh, as a historian, you have to then play a sort of trick on your own mind where you forget whatever you know. Uh, so confronting these critical decisions in the Pacific in July 1944, well I have no idea what's going to happen in the future. There were many who believed that Japan would continue to fight through 1947, uh, except for a very small circle uh, of American leaders. Uh, no one knew about the Manhattan Project. No one knew that there was such a weapon, the possibility of such a weapon. Uh, and so you're viewing all of these, uh, I the narrative uh, approach, I think, has the potential at its best to bring you closer into the way that these individuals were uh, thinking about the, the world that they confronted at that time. So it's more related to TR's quote about uh, imagination than it is simply about broadening the appeal of history. Right, playing a, a trick on yourself as the writer, but then inviting the reader into that kind of process of, let's forget that we know how this ends, and let's try to put ourselves into that room when we don't have that, that knowledge that, that uh, comes with the perspective of posterity. Thank you. Yep. Was it more damaged to the Japanese fleet? overall uh, from our submarines or our Air Force? Uh, the, um, I just looked at these statistics from the JANIC. Uh, <coughs> Carrier Air got more of the Japanese fleet, but not by an enormous margin. Uh, so the submarines got almost as much of the uh, Japanese naval tonnage as did Carrier Air. Yeah. Going back to your comments on the, your first strategy, um, was there a, a 
arguments that went through and all the forces that uh, MacArthur and Nimitz eventually got. Is there any evidence, based on your research, uh, that uh, the, the invasion into France was delayed at all uh, because of the, uh, the, the just a few forces that they got, or was based on the industrial buildup? Yeah, by, by uh, 1944, there was just so much, um, you know, war material arriving on the frontiers of all of these, uh, all of, in all of these theaters that uh, there really wasn't any significant constraint on being able to launch the invasion of France in the same month as the uh, Marianas campaign, which I think is really the most extraordinary testament really to the uh, uh, potent industrial potential of, of this economy. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, I think we've used up the hour and <laughs> we'll have to get on to class. Uh, so thank you very much for being here. If you have other questions, you have books to sign, uh, uh, Mr. Toll will be here for a little bit. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much.